Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Well, welcome Michael to Waits. ATP Waits. Stories. We are all about the stories behind the ecosystem in Asia that makes the Asian startup ecosystem so interesting and so exciting. And one of those stories that I want to share with you today, a lady who has been nominated to the Women in Fintech Power List. She's a Femtech leader. She's also a curious breed, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. She's a banker turned entrepreneur who's lived everywhere from Cleveland to Chicago to Chiang Mai, of all places. She's the CEO of Portfolio Quest and chairman of Bankers Lab, Michelle Katix. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi, Michelle. Hello. Fantastic to have you here. I know we're going to yeah, talk, we were just talking, for the listeners who can't hear, we were chatting off there because there's so much to talk about because you've got such an interesting journey, your career, if I can use that word, career, because it's a <laughs> maverick career indeed. I mean, you were at the Fed, the Federal Reserve, the IMF, Standard Chartered, very, very traditional institutional names. You went to Northwestern University up there in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also talk about what you do now. But there's so many interesting pivots in your career there. Where do we start? Let's talk about what you do now and then sort of work a little bit backwards as to how you got there. So for the listeners, share with us what Michelle Katix does on a daily basis right here, right now. Sure. Well, first of all, what I get to do uh, every day when I'm in Singapore is turn up at Lattice 80, which is the big fintech workspace here. And that has been a great pivot because we have started our company sort of in pajamas at home over the years. So it's the first time for us to all be coming into an office. So on, you know, kind of a life in the day of Michelle has, has changed last November and it's just been um, really exciting to be able to not only see the ecosystem mature, but also just be right at the center of it. So we work from Lattice 80, our team, uh, the Bankers Lab and Portfolio Quest teams are here we sell software to banks, so uh, we also work with regulators, and we're doing national competitions. So in our software, bank employees can compete against each other to practice managing virtual portfolios. So the, the, the notion is in high-risk industries or high-stakes industries such as uh, the airline industry, military, medical – you cannot do your job until you practice and demonstrate you can do it in a simulated or virtual environment, right? Uh, would you get in the plane if the pilot had only taken an e-learning multiple choice test, oh, sort of the, yeah, which is sort of the premise here. So we do the equivalent for the financial industry so people can get just an endless supply of virtual portfolios. They can practice, they can integrate their knowledge of ethics and governance and digital banking into that process. So it's a very, it's, it's not like we're reinventing anything. I mean, pilots have been doing this for a long time, but when you step back and look at the industry and see some of the issues you have, you just say, what, why weren't we doing this before? Why are we, certifying people with e-learning quizzes for high stakes jobs. It just doesn't make sense. So on a daily basis, we work with bank clients, regulators, and you know, other industry stakeholders. So what kind of portfolios are you talking about? Is, are these equity portfolios or are these sort of lending or fixed income and lending portfolios? Can you just tell me a little bit more about that and then I can get a better sense for how this would work? Sure. Right now we, we simulate all types of uh, retail lending portfolio. So anything okay. that's defined as as retail lending asset class under the Basel II Accord. So uh, exposures under a million euros approximately. So that would be your mortgage, credit card, small business loans, etc. We can also do P2P. We're, we're now going into microfinance. Uh, so we can, we can pump those out. And there's about 200 uh, parameters. So we can make it look and feel like somebody's local blending environment so you've almost basically taken over this is like almost doing um taking over the management training program for something like i don't know the bank of new york or for bell and bank if they even still exist so is that is that fair or is it more than that it's got to be more than that for sure yeah i mean i think i think initially when you look at it 
people say, oh, how cute. That's a train. No, it's nice. It's actually really, it's really, really interesting to me because all I'm doing is replaying in my mind, right, the training that I went through when I moved on to, like, the trading desk at Morgan Stanley. Yes. It really, yes. Was, just, it really was, and Michelle, you, you and I, I believe, have probably spoken about this too, but yes. it really was just like sitting next to some dude who was yelling at me. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm not kidding. It was, yeah. and it was swearing yeah. and like, what are you, and remember he was a well-educated dude as well. It's not like he was some idiot. He was just screaming like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? That's ridiculous. You're a retard. Like that, that was the training. And I like what you say because, <clears throat> you know, you could do some really big trades and also really big loans and they're super high risk, but that's why you take risk management courses. But back then no one was doing this in a simulated or even a real time environment. And I have to believe that with the tools that you can probably build or have at, um, at portfolio quest that the ability to really simulate that is probably pretty powerful now. Yeah. We, when we started bankers lab, we, we did this simulation in a workshop or a classroom environment. So we've, we've done these workshops for people from over 50 countries and, you know, they work in teams, they're competing against each other. And it is stunning to see people's reactions to this. We've had people in tears. We had really senior pe- I mean, <laughs> really senior people at tears. You're like, wow, okay. And people remember it. It sticks. I mean, you, you don't forget a course, and, and the teams really bond, and, and the lessons really stick. So, um, you know, I remember one course. It was in the U.S., and, and the other trainer, I remember him just trying to impress upon these people, you know, when you're doing retail lending, there's only so much you can mitigate after you book these loans. It's all about the cu- getting the customer value prop right, right? The the right interest loan, exposure, the right product for the right customer, and then the risk management is all so much easier, right? Yeah, because once it's on the books, then you're just risk managing, right? I mean, yeah, and you, there's only so much you can – you can only mitigate around the edges once you've booked the stuff. and. And they sat there looking at him like, yeah, of course, we're seizing risk measures. Of course we know that. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the course, I mean, they were like, we want to explain to everyone how important it is. And they basically repeated back, but they, it's like they forgot he said it. And he's right. back going, didn't I say that on day one morning? They're like, oh, you did? <laughs> so it's interesting that, that him saying it, they didn't, it just, they were like, yeah, yeah, right, of course. Wow. And then they actually had to do it. Um, so who, was, who is in tears in this this scenario? Who is actually well, crying? Actually, we've had uh, we've had two we've, we've had two instances where we had to sop up tears. One was actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to give you a hug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. One was a, uh, in Lebanon. For those of you who have worked with Lebanese, uh, uh, highly skilled uh, professionals are one of their biggest exports highly educated, highly strategic minds there. And what I learned when I arrived is highly competitive. So they took this very seriously. And, and God bless you talk to people in the U S military about doing a flight simulation and they'll tell you, no, no, even though it's a simulated, like $50 million jet, if you crash it in the simulation, it is no joke. No, people, people don't want to lose. Right, you will. I mean, your career will be seriously hampered if you crash the virtual fifty million dollar jet. So these people like took it that seriously, and it. there was a team right at the last minute. They made a wrong decision, and they were convinced they were going to win, and they didn't. So they were devastated. Oh, wow. um, it's more just the competition. The other one was more of an interpersonal thing of a team who kept fighting with each other, so they were losing tons of money. And then I kind of coached them and then they were able to get their act together and work as a team and it popped and they suddenly made a bunch of money and they were really emotional because they were saying, you know, our bosses always tell us if we don't work across units and as a team, it hits the bottom line, but we just thought it was their way to just motivate us, but they're not kidding. (laughs) 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 So, you know, it's stuff you tell people. And then, and then, like they're telling it back. You're like, oh, okay, I, I, I guess you guys got it. That's cool. <laughs> so, can I can I ask you a question? So, like, just going back to Northwestern, right? Like, as a you're an economics and an honors, what is it, Phi Beta Kappa economics honors student in economics at Northwestern in Chicago in the late '80s and early '90s. Yes, yes, we'll all date myself. Uh, yes, you can, <laughs> you can carbon date me. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, don't do that to me, Michelle. <laughs> yes, we use punch cards. Do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> really, next question, please. No, I was only saying that because this again, I don't want to. I don't want to delve off. I don't want to make a like a U turn into this topic. But you kind of like if you're in Chicago at Northwestern in the late '80s and early '90s, and you're in the Phi Beta Kappa, and you're studying economics and applied mathematics. I mean, Chicago, Northwestern has always been a pretty progressive place, right? So unlike some of the places on the coast that teach the same things. But, like, I have to imagine that there weren't that many women in your classes. Am, am I wrong? Um, Tell me. Because I feel like the whole, everything you've that, done, right, whether it's been the IMF or, or the Fed, you know, you're a, you're a pioneer in a way, it feels like to me. And I think that's an amazing thing. And then mm-hmm. to go on and, like, start a company that's not just in – a training in a gamification business, but that's in training gamification in a in the in the finance world is just incredible yeah. to me. Yeah. Well, it was I think for me at Northwestern, the undergraduate classes were a little more mixed, but I mostly took grad Graduate classes. classes. Yeah. And and then I mean, it wasn't just being a woman; I was highly intimidated, not but from being a woman, but in the grad school. I'd look around. I'm like, okay, so the Russian dude next to me right, already right, right. has a PhD in this topic. <laughs> He's coming here for fun to get a degree from Northwestern. I turn to my left. It's a dude from China who has two PhDs, one possibly in physics. So I was highly intimidated. One possibly in physics. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 he doesn't really, you know, he's he's still learning English even though he has two PhDs. So I won't embarrass him and ask him, but I, I'm kind of getting the picture. So I was highly intimidated in that sense, and it it wasn't a gender thing. It was just a <laughs> I need to I need to up my game. Fair enough. I guess well, that's just my mis- that's just my misconception, right? But can you tell me this? So you do all this stuff at the Fed, which must have been fascinating right so i was a fixed income trader we used to watch the fed all the time chicago actually ends up being one of the more powerful federal reserve banks which is interesting and one of them with the most influence and then to the imf you're doing real kind of government related but like non-government type stuff and then obviously you end up at standard charter but how do you get to here like when do you wake up and just say i have all this experience and i have all this gravitas right because the gravitas is really important in my mind, particularly when it comes to I'm going to get up in front of people or build a business around training other people. They have to trust you and believe that you know all this stuff, right? And you do. Like I've met you in person. You have that thing that you can't teach. No, but you do. It's, it's really interesting because you can meet people that have it and that don't have it. And I always say like charisma is something you either have or you don't, but you can't be taught it. You, know, you can't tell someone, go up on stage and be charismatic. No, no, a little to the left. Now you're more charismatic. It doesn't work like that. But how, do you, like, how did you build into that? And when do you decide, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do it like this? Well, it wasn't – I mean, I think that, that – I mean, yeah, you've met me. And, yeah. you, and there is uh, – I think number one is I've always focused on I, – I want to find the root cause of any problem and solve it. And, and – well, people say, oh, that's great. On the other hand, like when I was at FICO, I was like the anti-sales force, right? I was the sales, <laughs> oh, they called me the sales prevention force because they'd send me out to a client and, and I'd be like, well, that's not going to solve your problem. <laughs> anti-sales sales prevention. <laughs> so I was like, do you want to call in the sales prevention force? But on the other hand, when I would go into a client and say, you absolutely have to do this, they would go, okay, let's do it mm-hmm. because – because they knew that that you know once they knew me, they weren't going to get a you know oh well this is our high revenue high margin products so I'll sell that too so I think you know I'm always interested in solving the the root cause I think and and the other thing is that that I I think that what I have probably doubled down on over the years is that just being really true to your instincts and and what you want to do and. That is that again, just like in our classes, it's easier said than done. You can say that, but at the end of the day, when you've got quarterly returns and revenue in a company you have to meet, or you're going to leave a job on principle, that's that's not so easy, right? Because s- focusing on solving the the core problem is usually the more expensive long term path versus you know shorter term path. So mm. it's not always that easy, um, but I've learned that that's that's kind of when I'm at my best. So I'll, I'll just do that, right? So do look for the the underlying ecosystem problem that that I can solve. So 
you know, for example, in this case, if we really solve this, if we certified and rewarded bankers, now set aside, put a pin in the whole compensation structure, put a pin in that, but in terms of skill sets and people getting recognized, if you really did it based on something more quantitative and they could just demonstrate their skills, they really know what they're doing, it, there's, it's a different world, right? You have a diversity piece. It's easier for people from diverse backgrounds to get promoted and get recognized. You take out some of the politics that we suffer from now in the banks in terms of promotions and, and leadership management. And you can transform the bank from sort of the manual skill sets to the strategic ones because you have data about people. You know who to to put in charge of, okay, now we have to, guys, we have to program the robots so you know who to put in charge. So that's a root cause that cuts across everything. Oh, and the regulators have great data about the bank. They know they have a skill landscape that is ideally predictive of conduct risk and competence. So so I, just, I really enjoy doing something that solves it core root cause and so can you tell me from the from the regulators perspective and again this is maybe off off piece a little bit but really interesting to me right because i i, I kind of like these businesses that sit on top of sort of everybody else's analytics and combines all those analytics together you know deutsche bank just to pick a bank out of the blue right and i worked there for a few years so have a little bit of insight in it but they just seem seem to keep breaking all the rules and it doesn't really right. matter, like which, but it, it's true, right? Like, it, and you just touched on this a little bit, right? It doesn't really matter which country they're operating in, or actually which group it is. There seems to be just some sort of overriding thing of, there's a money pot over there. Let's just run over there and grab it and <laughs> see if anybody catches us before we quit and go work at a at a nice place like Standard Chartered kind of thing. And I'm just wondering, like, with all the data that they have and that you see, I guess, if you're working with them, like, how? Is it so hard for them to disintermediate this, or are they just is their technology and their ability to analyze this just a little bit um, old fashioned? So they can't do it yet. And do you help them do that? Well, we 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 definitely interact with clients who are on various parts of the spectrum. So I'll give you a couple examples. First, shout out to DBS. They are, you know, foot forward in terms of uh, looking at data analytics about their employees and how they engage with that and manage their workforce. So they're very open to all of this and and, and keen to get their hands on the data and, and use that in a positive way. A large global bank who shall remain nameless um, when I explained this to them, they went very quiet and I said, okay, so let's, let's just try to draw this out a little bit. I said, so right now you comply with the UK conduct and competency risk regulations through some ticky box e-learning stuff. Right. So, yeah, yeah. That's internal, correct. Internal. Right. Because that was the other question I was going to ask you. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And so the, and I said, okay, so you guys are, and you're compliant, right? So you already ticked your regulatory box. So why rock the boat? And they said, yeah. I said, so is the analogy, you know, you have a bathroom scale and you kind of know it underestimates, your, but you're, you're, the, you're at your target weight. When you go to a hotel, there's a fancy digital scale that you know is really accurate. <laughs> Are you going to get on that thing? <laughs> One foot. And if the regular, you know, like if the doctor was watching, <laughs> who's been yelling at you about your weight, you're going to stand on that thing? No way. And, the, and they kind of laughed and said, yeah, that, 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 that's kind of how we feel. So I think it depends on the market and the relationship with the, the regulatory engagement where, you know, they're, you know, it's it's a little bit tricky in some markets because if you're being regulated, you're currently compliant and you're happy with a politically driven employee management system, then you know, you're not you're not gonna call Michelle. Mm. But yeah, so this if is, you're trying this to is... overhaul and be innovative and, and your regulator is positively engaging you saying, Hey, let's reward um, higher level skill sets then then certainly it's a different conversation. Yes, and the more I think about it, the more I believe that like these internal training programs, because I've been through them so many times, I mean, they're just massive CYA operations, right? Where the yeah, corporation exactly. themselves is trying to protect themselves by saying, I put my employees through this. Like you said, they took a box. It would be so much better to replace this with a company like yours, you know, not to start selling online right away, but it would be so much better to replace with a company like yours that actually has no particular vested interest in whether any particular bank is profitable or not. But if they just learn how to do stuff in a simulated environment, the stuff we used to do for training, you know, money laundering or KYC and all that stuff was just so bad. Well, yeah, and I, yeah. I, 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 I,
Yeah, and I think um, uh, shout out to Gary V, who's a big podcaster and 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 speaker. He had a good quote recently that you know in the past content was king. So you you know just, whoever had all the content and you just keep reselling it. But he makes a good point. Now context is king. So the other sort of simple but beautiful thing our team is doing is contextualizing that information. Yeah, that's so if I'm teaching, right? Yeah, like if I'm teaching you ethics in a bubble, you know all the right answers. Right, like, easy. Right, it's easy. You just pick the most difficult, painful, long option out of the multiple choice and, and you pass. But when I integrate that into a simulated business decision, it's like, okay, now you feel the weight of that trade-off. Uh, on the bottom line. So you've got to, to navigate that and take the hard decisions. So really that contextualization of everything people have to learn into the business decisions is, I think, a, a way forward in terms of of certifying that people can be thoughtful and diligent about those hard trade-offs and, but, you know, both know the technical information, but then apply it when they're on the front line and making you're, business decisions. You're also, you're also gamifying this, right? The oh, whole yeah. thing's gamified. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's understating exactly how, how much gamification is going on. But can you tell me this too? Are you gamifying across institutions? In other words, if I'm at Standard Charter or if I'm at Deutsche Bank, am I just competing against my peers inside my own company or is it, is it inside the industry where I'm competing? So like the Deutsche team or people there go against the Goldman team or whatever it is. Is that how it works? I mean, I know most of this is retail, so I'm kind of picking the wrong banks, but still. Uh, well, we're doing, we're doing both. Um, uh, at some client sites, it'll be you know, within the bank. They com- there's a leaderboard, and they're competing with each other. Right. Um, we're also doing national competitions. We're, we're rolling out a national competition in Malaysia through the Asian Banking School so that you know the different – the different employees will sign up and and compete against each other across the banks. And in Singapore, shout out to MAS and the FinTech Festival, we are running a nationwide competition among the, the university students as a way to bring awareness to uh, FinTech careers. Uh, they'll get awards at the FinTech Festival. And also it's a way for companies to I- identify top talent. Yeah, I was going to say, wouldn't it be neat? So the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is what you referenced at the MAS, right, for those people that are listening that don't necessarily know what that is, but you could do this to seniors in college or second-year MBA students. Mm. This could be another big part, a huge part of your business, and I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but it's interesting to me, right, because the thing that, the thing that banks definitely don't know before you join is, A, how you'll act under pressure, right, yes. how, you, how you handle real risk. I remember... I love telling this story. So I remember we were interviewing somebody for the portfolio trading desk at, um, I'm going to say it, at Goldman Sachs. And I remember this guy, one of the questions that I like to ask people because they were going to be new to the trading desk and actually new to the trading environment, like, you know, tell me the biggest risk you've ever taken. Just so I can understand your comfort with this. You know, normally people will say, okay, you know, I bungee jumped off the highest building in Singapore, which scares the stuff out of me. So that's pretty risky, you know. Or, you know, I, I left my job and I, you know, backpacked around Europe with no shoes on kind of thing. You know, it's something where there's an you know, embedded risk. And I remember this one guy said to me, um, when I was seven years old, my mom let me play hockey with the 10-year-olds. <laughs> and, I was like, and I was like, wait a second. So that's the biggest risk you've ever taken and you're 35 years old. Like wow. that's the story you want to reference for your ability to take risk. And he was like, "Yeah, I thought it was a pretty big deal. They were three <laughs> years older than I was, and they were bigger kids. And you know, hockey, there are fights." And I literally, I was like, in my mind, that interview was over because <laughs> the, sim- the simulated risk that he was talking about had nothing to do, and it was so long ago. Right. And in the right. interim, he told me he'd done nothing. So I just thought it was kind of funny. And he joined, actually. They hired him, which I thought was just insane. And then, like, six months later, he literally broke down crying on the desk and, like, never came back because he couldn't take the risk. And if you can, can simulate Can, can that, I steal your interview question? Yeah, you should. <laughs> and, and if you're listening to this because you're going to interview with us, you just got your interview hack. So exactly. hat tip to those of you who did research before your interview. Well done. <laughs> right. But you know what I mean? So that's what you're doing, though. You're simulating a risk environment as well, right? So it's like... You know, no one's going to hire somebody to play baseball or football or soccer without watching them play, like in the minor leagues, right? And I'm not well, saying we're in the minor league. But like, how have we gotten away with doing it this way for so long? I just don't yeah. even get it. And and I don't understand why, like passing 
you know, an MBA at Harvard where you've done a case study on banking even qualifies you to sit down and make risk decisions on millions of dollars. Like you've never done that before. And you don't understand that concept of risk, right, which is what, what you're simulating in risk management. It's so hard to understand unless, unless you're in it. And we see this in so many different places, if you don't mind me saying. Like we actually had – we had people come – we did this gigantic trade once and you know made a lot of money on it. But boy, technically, it was super hard and we carried a lot of risk. And I remember once one of, you know, one of the guys that came to talk to us after we did this trade was like, yeah, that trade was a layup. So if you know what a layup is, it's just like a really easy thing where no one's playing defense and it just rolls into the basket. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the response from the head of the desk was, you know, in very colorful terms, <laughs> was – have you ever been naked long a billion dollars worth of securities overnight? Ever? So simulating that, and that's most, and the answer to that for most people is, I don't even know what that means, but definitely I haven't done that. Um, yeah. Just like I haven't driven on a highway with a blindfold on. But what you're doing, so that simulation I think is really important. I'd love to understand kind of what it's like when you walk into a banking institution and sell this to them. Because they already do a whole bunch of internal training, most of which is noise. We already talked about that. But what's it like? When, what's the sales thing like when you walk in and say, here's what we have to offer, and here are what some of the outcomes are like? Like, how does that work? Well, I, I mean, when I talk to any lending institution, I, I tell them, I, tell, me, tell me what your problems are in the next year. Business problems. Don't tell me about training problems. Right, so, right. Right. So are you trying to build your top line? Are you trying to take are you on office offense or defense in terms of you know fintech challengers taking your top line are you having rising losses are you trying to overhaul your workforce because then that informs you know what cut at this we can take because the this type of tool has i think the challenge that we faced in talking to banks is that this kind of tool has so many use cases so rather than you know say well here's like 25 use cases, which one looks good to you? I just say, for, for, just tell me your problems first, and then I'll show you, how, what, you know, how we can how we can throw something at it that, you know, you get a huge ROI, right? So if we can, you know, if we put all of your collections managers who are doing your your debt collection strategy through a simulation training, and if you even improve your your collections by 0.0001% as a result, the cost of this training, it's like a no brainer. It's like a 500 X ROI. I mean, it's just, it's just out of the park. So difficult to quantify that because I can't necessarily right. exactly measure that, that, you know, these portfolios move around as a result of that training, but anecdotally we've seen it and we can certainly try to size the ROI. So really we look at this more as a business ROI rather than, um, you know, because of, you know, I'm not going to bother competing against Tiki Box training. Like, okay, no, if you guys have to not. do it because you got to do your COI, go for it. But, you know, I'm not trying to solve that problem. I'm, I'm much more interested, actually, to a certain extent, not just in the financial risk, but like in, in the human side of this, right? So, you know, corporations are these big political environments, right? And the more people they are, maybe the more politicized they get because it's hard to control culture, its size. Right. So the, I, I have to believe that there are people, you know, sitting in a lending institution or sitting in a lending role um, that aren't actually doing anything that are taking credit for other people's you know, lending skills and ability to analyze not just individual loans, but on a portfolio basis. Right. So portfolio optimization actually ends up being a big deal in any kind of risk environment. Right. And I wonder if that falls out when you do your gamification stuff like Tom who's like taking credit for everything that like Lisa does somehow finds out during the simulation. He really has no idea what he's doing. Do you see any of that? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, so for example, we'll in a workshop, it is really interesting because you'll have a mixed team and you, you'll, you'll have one member who's very quiet, soft-spoken analytic type. You'll have kind of the loud one in the first round, the quiet one will just sort of sit there and then try to make a suggestion. Oh, but why don't we do this? And they'll ignore that person and start losing money. And then at some point, you know, if I see they're continuing to not listen to this person, uh, you know, I'll just gently say, 
I don't know, you guys might want to do that thing that this quiet person just said. And then they, and then suddenly they start making money and then the whole team dynamic changes. So I've seen teams go from this sort of very quiet person who probably never even tries to take credit for anything. By the end, they're like, um, so this person is going to go up and make the presentation because they're going to work for us. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and, and and yeah, I mean, and the cool part is we don't even have to do anything. I just stand there and, you know, sit in my tea and make a couple of pithy comments, just keep an eye on people to make sure that, you know, if I have to gently intervene from time to time. So I think for us, the challenge is in the fully digital environment, you know, you don't have that team dynamic. So we're using both interventions at our client site. So we do a workshop, but the online is brings individual accountability and accreditation and time for people. If people need more time to practice, they can do that. So, so we're seeing that, you know, each intervention, in the workshop versus the fully digital kind of each they they, you know, the two together, you know, one plus one is three, like right? the two together are, are really powerful. Mm. Michelle, I just want to change gears a little bit here on your background as well, because I think it's kind of important for the listeners to get a bit of context of you. I know listening to you, people can appreciate that you are skilled in your domain. You know banking as good as anybody else, especially with the training side. But there's some really interesting facts about your background, which I think give it another dimension to what you're doing. And, and maybe people can understand better as well the fact that you're going into these organizations and creating some kind of a change. Because I'm just looking down my notes here, and I want you to kind of put us in the picture a little bit. Because when I first had these notes put in front of me, I was like, hang on a second. Is this the same woman? (laughs) So I want you to put this right for us. I'm just going to read this stuff out, and you you can then, you know, tell us what we need to know. Uh So you, you, well, this is all good. Don't worry. I mean, this is fascinating. You, first of all, you trained and volunteered as a firefighter. Correct. I've got the right person here. I'm just going through this. Okay. (laughs) Technical rescue, emergency medical technician. And, all right, there's this really interesting quote, a former colleague of yours at Standard Chart said about you, that people think that Michelle working in a refugee clinic, we haven't even talked about the refugee clinic, by the way. No, I didn't even get there yet. Exactly. Was a blip in her banking career. What they don't understand is that being a banker was the blip. And hold on a second, hold on a second. There's something else I want to throw out here because this sort of also arcs into, I think maybe where you may have met Michael first or there was a connection there. But So you started in Cleveland, you moved to Chicago and then you started Bankers Lab, as far as I know, in Chiang Mai, in Thailand, right? (laughs) So there's just, there's a whole lot in there which the listeners won't have known. But now that they understand that about you, it's just kind of like there's a whole bunch of questions we've got about you now. So put us in the picture. What's going on? (laughs) Yeah, when I was a young lass, yes, I was a firefighter. I was an emergency medical technician. Um, Even as I worked at the International Monetary Fund, I hate, this is terrible to say. I was like, you know, I think the jury is still out on this whole banking career. I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not. (laughs) Jury's still out. And, you know, I was was a bit bored. And and I thought, well, I don't know. Let's stay in shape, learn something. And I'm a learner. I, lo- I love to learn new things. And yeah, it was, I mean, I had a blast. I was in the, I worked, so I'd work at the International Monetary Fund during the day and then I'd go straight to the station at night and it was a, it was a fully professional team except for myself. So I was a volunteer with them. They were actually the team that were incident command at the Pentagon on September 11th. That was after I had left. Yeah. Um, but that team was, it was a, very special team. It was not just any group of firefighters. They were hardcore technical rescue, always pushing the envelope. Like they'd say, Oh, we're going to do training drills today. Okay. What are you guys going to do? Oh, you know what? We're going to, we're going to set up a Tyrolean traverse between the, the USA today buildings. <laughs> and, uh, and go- so people would be walking on the side, would look up however many stories. And these guys are just for fun, uh, Tyrolean traversing between the two buildings. So it was certainly like a happy home for me. Cause they're all learners wow. and wanted to practice stuff. Um, so you yeah. IMF by day, IMF by Tyrolean day. Traverse by evening. Yeah, right. Tyrolean Traverse. It's insane. That's great. What a... And I, you know, I just I didn't think anything of it. I just, you know, and of course I didn't tell anyone at the. No one except the secretary knew, um, and 
once I did come in from a working fire and I showered, but I didn't have time to wash my hair. And she was like, you need to go back in the bathroom and wash your hair. I can smell smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and we know you weren't like, smoking. And, and we know you don't smoke. So go, go wash your hair. I was like, thank you. Um, now that we did a lot of, after we moved to California, just a lot of trekking and backcountry travel, cycling through various uh, countries like back in the day through Burma and Laos. So the EMT, I became an emergency medical technician more as a survival instinct. Like I think I should know this stuff based on my leisure activities and did some canyoneering and that sort of thing. So those were just, that was just sort of skill building to support my, my hobbies, I guess. Um, and the, the, the refugee clinic was still like, hmm, I still, even at, at, at middle age, I was like, Jury's still out in this banking thing. (laughs) (laughs) And, and I thought that I'm right before the financial crisis, I thought I might do a second career and go into public health. So I thought, well, I better road test this idea first before I just like go back to school. Um, So I only went for a month to kind of volunteer there after I had left standard chartered and I ended up staying for two years and I, for for those folks, you know, the ironic part is for the folks who say, I want a career in fintech or I want to leave my traditional sector job and, and move. Like mm-hmm. I didn't do a traditional move from banking straight to a startup, right? No. But the skills I picked up at that clinic actually are some of them were some of the most valuable that helped me start a company. I was going to ask you that. Like what – and it sounds like a silly question trying to make some bad equivalency, but I don't think so at all. Like what do you, what do you learn there? What do you transfer from that environment into the environment where you operate now? Oh, it's more, it's more like a startup than you think. So at the clinic where I had zero budget, we had a, a high concentration risk on some big government uh, INGO donors. I had no resources, and I didn't know what I was doing. The same and thing. I, hasn't right, changed. So I was like, this is just like a startup. <laughs> All right. And I taught myself WordPress. I diversified the funding sources. I We had kind of the B2B strategy with the INGO. So I developed a B2C funding strategy to supplement. I taught myself social network. I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about doing mailing lists and social sharing. I, you know, I taught myself to, to create little videos for them, just kind of all the stuff in a startup that to survive, you have to just be able to do that stuff really fast, those, those basic skills. And it just really thinking through all that and teaching yourself to do it. And, you know, when we started Bankers Lab, I mean, every single one of those skills, I was just like, oh, this is easy. I'll set up a website. I can set up a mailing list. Mm-hmm. I can, you know, do a campaign. I can, you know, do all the graphics. You know, not that I did a fantastic job of it, but I could at least get the version zero done and then get somebody to clean it up, mm-hmm. which is kind of, you know, how we typically do stuff in a startup. Yeah, and one of the things I say to startups all the time is, you know, it, you know, no individual day is fatal. And no one's, like, if this doesn't work or that doesn't work, no one's going to die. But exactly. the reality is that at the clinic, someone could actually die. So you're operating in an environment where mm-hmm. it is kind of very startup-like with not great resources, maybe not even great distribution and all that stuff. And yet the, the urgency of what you're doing is really high because there are people's lives at stake. Oh, yeah. And, you know, working in a startup, you know, it's like, oh, no, we're not going to make payroll on time. And, and mm-hmm. you guys, maybe maybe you won't be able to, to go to the bar for a day or two. <laughs> I was going to say. And, oh, you poor things. And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, when, and, yeah, and, and I've talked about this before in interviews. I mean, that that experience has broken me of, of it's like you can't scare me because if we missed payroll, we had – a huge uh, set of employees who were refugees themselves. And if they didn't get paid, they right. had nowhere to go. So they would try to go back to their home villages and and it could get them killed because they had to go through, uh, you know, active conflict areas to get there because they could go back to do a livelihood where they came from. But um, in all likelihood, it was, you know, at a very high risk to their lives. So, so we really had to make payroll all the time. And, right. and, and the difference... The difference is striking, right, between what it's like to work at sure. the clinics as a startup and a startup as a startup. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes, you know, I, I mean, if any, I've done anything, it makes the 
doing a startup look like a cakewalk. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and everybody listening to this knows that it is absolutely not a cakewalk. So, no, it's, no, it's a good experience. I, so, yeah, so <laughs> I, I like to put things in relative terms, right? So, Graham and I talk about this all the time. If I say that's easy, I just mean it's easy in terms of the other sixty things we have to do that are not easy at all. So, it's not easy, but it's relatively easy, right? I mean, obviously, doing a startup, you know this. Have you funded these companies? Like, so has Bankers Lab been funded, and has Portfolio Quest been funded, or have you bootstrapped that yourself? Like, how does that work? Bankers Lab was uh, mainly bootstrapped. Founders put in a bit of cash, and then we bootstrapped from there on out. Uh, Portfolio Quest is venture backed. Shout out to WaveMaker VC, part of the Draper Network, who's been hugely strategic for us to. To be to up our game from being bootstrappers, which is sort of one approach to a startup, and I'm finding how different that is from being venture backed. Where it's so different, right? I mean, yeah, it's totally really different. different. Do you and, deal with Paul Santos or? Yes, and I I definitely need some some tutoring from time to time, and he's really gracious to, to give really me good. that. Right. I mean, so so shout out to Paul. Thanks for all the tutoring because you know even the metrics, just the way yep. you think about building the business, the timelines, the time scales that you really have to plan for, are very different. And and although a lot of uh, VCs will say, oh yeah, we love bootstrappers, but in reality, there, we ha- bootstrappers create our own blind spots. So I've mm-hmm. had to to really. Um, you know, rethink how I look at some of the the company company building and evolution. Has the funding like when did you get funded? And I'm curious, just based on my own experience, like has the funding sort of changed your ability to generate revenue? Has it accelerated things at a pace that you didn't understand before you were funded? Can you just explain to me how that's felt and how that's worked? Well, I think that then in our case, in case of Portfolio Quest. Um, it's it's interesting because if you think about the spectrum of startups and and if you if you look here in Southeast Asia you've got kind of the the B2C stuff which is really suited to a VC time scale Basically. and and returns and then you have the deep tech plays on the other end of the spectrum where you have SG Innovate uh, and guys like Steve Leonard intervening to make sure and they have kind of a longer play and a longer investment cycle right. The challenge for us is we, we were kind of right in the middle of that spectrum. We're a bit of a longer play. We've had to build uh, a pretty pretty robust platform, which has, has taken some time, file patents, which costs money. Um, so we're a little, a little bit more skewed towards the deep tech side, although we had the head start with Bankers Lab, so that helped us mitigate that. So – the the venture backing has allowed us to kind of blend that and still take that deep tech approach and build something really rich and at the same time you know go out and sell that and also it allows us to to make sure that we keep the long game in mind i think that's the key thing so when you're bootstrapping you you know you're just trying to stay alive till tomorrow you can't necessarily right. you may right. long dream about the long game, but yeah, Ultimately, yeah. you can't necessarily yeah. cater to that day to day, but but with with venture backing and with somebody like Paul who has a strong vision, you can keep your eyes on the long game and say, "We're trying to change the whole paradigm of the industry." So, is is every client that we're working with is reg- every regulatory engagement actually getting us there? Whereas, if I was bootstrapping, I would just say, "Is it getting money in the bank?" Right. Like, how can I survive until next month? We joked a little bit about making payroll, but to be fair, you kind of have it to make payroll. Otherwise everybody goes, <laughs> yeah, I mean, otherwise, everybody goes and works at another startup that actually has been funded or, or some other place where they can actually get paid. Yeah, exactly. That's so right. I, I'm conscious of the time here. I know we could go on. There's so much to talk about, but I want to kind of bring it to a natural conclusion. I mean, you could just take any part of your background michelle and what you've done just take one part of that and we could talk at least an hour on each subject whether it's the fed or firefighting or your your work up on the thai burma border or whatever or even what you're doing now with portfolio quest and bankers lab we've got to do a part two i think what do you think michael do you think there's more i was just thinking the same thing i mean it's so to me it's so interesting when you meet somebody who has such a compelling story but who also is you know eloquent enough in telling that story it's really you kind of don't want to stop talking Totally. Oh, I, and don't you love hearing a banker saying shout out? 
<laughs> <laughs> well, and 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 for those of you listening to this, I mean, some of the themes that I that I really get excited to talk about are developing the talent in the Southeast Asian ecosystem. Yes, yeah, same here. You know and that, right? Really Absolutely. pushing, yeah, pushing people to to take a risk and and do something in the startup sector outside the incumbent industry um, to to think outside the box to try new things we're seeing more of it and it's it's but it's still nascent so you know anything I can suggest to people in terms of how to pick up those skills how to have the courage to to do something different I think for your audience I, I certainly hope that that people are getting excited about that for sure well yeah, Michelle I mean, you know what the, the way that people learn is is through story and your story is the best way people can learn how to take risk because people yeah, will need a, a role model right you know it's all very well sitting down and telling people this is you know show them the book but when they hear your story people say ah here's somebody like me i can do that and yeah. be inspired. absolutely everybody can i mean I, I have this firm belief you just have to decide you're going to do it. i think people put artificial sort of limitations uh and boxes around themselves i think and, you know, you start small, you try new things, you change your own behaviors and patterns and test new things and, and slowly you realize that, that you can totally do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Hey, before we ask you to give us some links to uh, help us find out a bit more about you, I'm going to hand it over to Michael. So I know he's not going to forgive me if he doesn't let me let you ask one more question. Go, Michael, I know I'm sure you've got tons of questions. You've got a whole list of questions here on the notes. We haven't even gone through. A, a third know. of them, right? I know. One last question questions. before we hand back over to Michelle. Go for it. So my, my last question is really this: is like, will you come back and talk to us more? I, I'd really love to do some follow up. You know, a few months in, not a year out, but just like a few months in to make sure because we didn't really get to talk about business growth, which is really important to me, and also the fact that you know you started this whole thing in Chiang Mai and you moved to Singapore. You said what at the end of last year, probably after funding is my is my guess. Which yeah. is important. Yeah. Now you have an office where everybody shows up. I'm curious, like now, how you develop, but also your business is not unique necessarily to the region. So you see a lot of businesses being built here. You know, this is only going to work in Singapore. It's only going to work in Malaysia or Vietnam. But what you're doing is global from day one, right? So if you're dealing with DBS, who has offices all over the world, you're going to install this and work with them globally. But to be fair, and every bank with Singapore is a banking center, not just regionally but globally. The possibility to have a global business means that you as a team, right, so the Bankers Lab team, the Portfolio Quest team, but also your WaveMaker supporters have also seen this as a potential global business. We didn't get a chance to talk about that either. So I guess my question is, would you come back in a few months to follow? Oh, absolutely. And we'll, we'll report back on our big Singapore competition and all the other things we have going on and how those are going. We'll have lots yeah, I'm, of I'm, I'm I'm really curious because I'm really curious about that, but I, I don't want to talk about it now because that could be another hour long or more conversation. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave a cliffhanger for everybody. Here. Exactly. <laughs> Who did shoot JR anyway? <laughs> <laughs> and and the one other thing I'd ask, and you know, on, on tape, off tape, it doesn't really matter to me. Is you know, tell people that you talk to us, and tell people that they should listen to it, and you know, help us get your word not just out for you know regionally but globally. Because the people that do listen to this do sit in New York, they sit in San Francisco, yeah. they sit in Japan, and knowing what you are doing for them is not just an investment opportunity, but it's also a business opportunity. And and like Graham said, it's just hearing the story is really. Mm. Um, it's really compelling. Absolutely. Um, my pleasure. Yeah. So that will help as well. There's a banker out there somewhere staring out the window right Saying, now. What am I supposed to do? I want to call Michelle. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's inspiring. It, I'm sorry. Like, I'm going to keep talking a little bit. But it's very <laughs> inspiring to see somebody. I know, Graham. <laughs> let, me, let me add this. It's very inspiring to see somebody. You know, I always say this, right? Like, you're from Cleveland and you were in Chiang Mai. Like, the, the chances of that, you knowing that was going to happen when you were like a little kid were zero. Yeah, I love Cleveland, Just, but all I knew is I had to get out of there. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And look, I know plenty of people got friends in Shaker Heights, which is not Cleveland, but I got friends in Cleveland as well. And you know, my sister lives in um, in Columbus, so I, I get the whole thing. But just the fact that you're here is, is amazing, and what you've done is nothing short of phenomenal. So, I love it. that's Michelle Katix, everybody, CEO of Portfolio Quest, Chairman of Bankers Lab. Wow accommodations uh well we've got a whole list here we put it all in the show notes but i'm just going to ask michelle about where we can find out more about her absolutely the uh two great places to go you can follow us on twitter 
The handle is at FinTalent. And the website is fintalent.com. Fintalent meaning financial talent, which is what we're trying to build here. Fantastic. Awesome. Michelle, thank you so much for coming and sharing your journey with us today. It's been inspiring and we look forward to an update on your journey in part two. Absolutely. Update to come. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.